Hello and welcome. This is an audio recording of a Wildlife and Landscape Committee meeting hosted by the Agua Dulce Homeowners Association. Agua Dulce is a wildlife-friendly community located in the Tucson Mountains. As such, our common areas host javelina, coyotes, and bobcats, among other wildlife, which are sometimes encountered by residents. In response, Bobcats in Tucson was invited to share details of its bobcat research and answer questions residents might have about wildlife encounters. For those who could not attend the open meeting, we hope you enjoy this audio recording. Let me briefly introduce Carrie and Gail. And uh, I'll talk first about Carrie. Carrie's a certified wildlife biologist and a co project coordinator for Bobcats in Tucson. And uh, Carrie is one of a team of 11 that supports bobcat research being conducted in the Tucson Urban Fringe, as I mentioned, under the umbrella of the Southwest Wild Conservation Center in Scottsdale, Arizona. The team's background includes a collective, I think between 150 and 200 years of wildlife management experience with Arizona Game and Fish. But Carrie also has a lot of local experience. He's uh, worked for more than 12 years at Pima County on the implementation of the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan acquiring, developing, and managing uh, over 250,000 acres of conservation lands within Pima County. <laughs> so Gail is the photographer for Bobcats in Tucson oh, and also oh. supports. Thank you very much, Gail, yeah. for being here today. Well, good. Thank you, Hans, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Gail started out, like a lot of you, as very interested in Bobcats. She had her own Bobcat over her, her place by Star Pass that she was tracking and watching and living with, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we got to meet her and invited her on uh, uh, one of our captures, and she's never left. Um, <laughs> you she, recruited me. <laughs> I did. I did. I recruited. She is kind of our official photographer, but has become a master bobcat trapper and and uh, uh, expert in a variety of areas. And just an example of the diversity of people that have been involved in this project. Yeah, you know, Hans mentioned eleven. That's kind of the core science team that, that is doing the research project and the grant, but we literally have hundreds of people like you that have picked up the phone or sent us an email and said, Avery's here, you know, in the case of Hans, she's in the backyard, here's what she's done. I've got a, you know, a background uh, a listing of all of her activities for you and uh, that kind of thing. And so it's been amazing to work with, with folks. Just to give you an idea, on our website, if you've never been to bobcatsintucson.net, please go. That's our website. There are hundreds of pictures there of a variety of our bobcats in the area. And here's some little cards that, that uh, Gail will send out. But one of the things that we asked for on the site is in the Tucson Basin, when COVID hit, we kind of restructured how we were going to talk to the community. And uh, so one of the things that we thought we'd ask is, what about sightings? Who sees bobcats in the Tucson Basin? And uh, we have 1,400 sightings across the Tucson Basin now in four years. So it's really interesting to see. To give you an idea how pervasive bobcats are, imagine Campbell and Grant, Arizona Inn, full-time female bobcat raising kittens in that neighborhood you know and so really the only part of the valley that we don't have good reporting and we think it's reporting it's not that the bobcats aren't there is around Tucson or around uh, Davis Montham Air Force Base in South Tucson otherwise it's it's a well distribution across the whole valley yeah how are you defining Tucson Basin does it include Green Valley does it include Red Rock <sighs> I mean, not Green Valley, probably Oro Valley is far north, then east okay, to Vale, the and then to the mountains here and south down to, say, um, I don't know, not, not very far south. So it's well, kind of a, an amorphous it, element, that you will. I think the idea was that it's not just Tucson, it is, you know, South Tucson, it is but not as far as down to Saharita and, and some of the other places. Yeah, yeah. Or, that, uh, that just extends our, our area. Madera Canyon and that kind of stuff. Yeah. There'd be a lot more down there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, more birds maybe. <laughs> maybe. We don't know. Uh, and uh, one of the fun things with the research is there's some new questions that 
are popping up that are challenging some of our thinking um, historically about bobcat populations. So anyway, fascinating little critter. Imagine this, this spotted cat, which in this world right now, most spotted cats are endangered or threatened in their population and survival. Not so the bobcat. They're doing great. Their distribution in North America is actually expanding right now. They're reintroducing themselves into some eastern states that weren't, haven't had bobcat populations for a long time because of habitat change and uh, uh, trapping kinds of activities that went on. And so we're, we're looking at this new bobcat population, so to speak. Well, in reality, it's not a new population. The bobcats that you are seeing here are just the generations that have been here for 10,000 years. These are not new bobcats. These have not moved in because you moved in to move into your backyard. <laughs> they were here. They've been here. They've been in a, a um, sustainable population for a long, long time. And one of the things that we um, like to kind of impress upon people is you moved into their backyard, not the other way around. Okay? So if you perceive that in a little bit, it just, we think, helps people realize their role in working and living with bobcats. And there's not a thing that we've found that says people and bobcats can't coexist. And mainly it's if people will just give up a few of their behaviors or modify their behaviors, then we'll have sustainable bobcat populations always through this kind of urban, suburban fringe. So bobcats are a fascinating predator. They're an aggressive little predator but they're also very much a small predator. They're oriented at prey that is generally the size of a rabbit or smaller. They have been known to take prey up to seven to eight times their body weight, which is in the 20 pound area. So they've been known to take 150 pound deer, especially in the Eastern United States, but not out here. They've been known to take other larger domestic animals but for the most part, that's a very, very uncommon thing. So when you hear a lot of the stories about, well, the bobcat came over the fence and killed my dog, and killed my Rottweiler, <laughs> and that's, that's probably a real long stretch. Does it happen? Has it happened? Yes. But is it common? No. And one of the things our research is doing in cooperation with a, uh, a graduate uh, at the University of Arizona is looking at diet. And uh, one of the neat new things, uh, the evolution of wildlife management is, now they've developed this, the ability to take hair and process that hair and come up with everything that that animal has eaten in terms of the species of animal. <laughs> and in some cases, uh, how much of that particular animal was a part of their diet. So it's phenomenal. It's just like some of the new work on DNA where we're able to look at relationships. Um, I don't know if some of you, I just find it's fascinating. Now they're able to go into a, a small water bowl and extract the DNA of anything that's drink, drank out of that bowl of water. So you don't always have to see the wildlife anymore. Now that you've got these abilities of new methodologies to uh, uh, determine locations and distributions and things like that. Yes? What is the population of bobcats in this area? A bunch. <laughs> <laughs> That's the scientific number. Do you have an estimate of... We, we, really, we haven't come up with an estimate. We're going to come up with an estimate and it isn't going to be worth much, but it's uh, the best we'll be able to do. When you, when you start looking at, at trying to establish a population, you essentially need to catch all the bobcats and recapture the bobcats. And then there are some statistical models that you can apply 
that then give you a, a, a population density kind of thing. We didn't even come close to touching all the bobcats in our study area. And our study area is from 36th Street to about Camino del, de, del Cerro, Silver Bell, over to the uh, boundary of Tucson Mountain Park and Saguaro National Park. That was the artificial area that we determined was our study area. Knowing full well the bobcats were going to tell us what our study area was <laughs> once we caught them and collared them and they began to move around. But it, it gave us a centralized location to look at. So we're going to go back in there and look and, and try to come up with some, uh, some kind of an estimate. We also are only going to be able to be talking about adults. But I think more important than how many is that from our perspective and what we've seen with the collared bobcats and tracking them, there is a bobcat every place there could be a bobcat. Mm -hmm. So they are socially determining the population themselves more than anything else. The females are very dominant in terms of having a home range that they patrol and they lay out. And when you look at the maps, and there's some maps over there, you'll see discrete color blocks that are a home range for a female or a female and a, uh, a I got a tape down, Hans. How about if we do our hands and show them home ranges? <laughs> so my, I have a small home range, a giant one. There's something, there's a home range butting up against every other home range. Think that's, of it as a puzzle that's piece. The female. So the she puzzle pieces all come together at the edge for the females. The males will then go over a variety of female habitats and so they have a larger home range. So what is that? What we're finding is that a female, on the average of our females, have about a four square mile home range and the adult males are in the 10 to 14 square mile home range. Now that varies. We've got some bobcats living down by Gale at Star Pass Resort and their whole, her home range was one square, a, one square mile or 600 acres. And she lived on the golf course, <laughs> right there on the golf course. And at my house. And at her house. And would go off the, bob, off the golf course into the nearby mountains, have her kittens, raise them, then bring them back to the golf course. And uh, then we have Avery, uh, which is one of our largest home ranges, and she's around 14 square miles uh, when she's not raising kittens and, and tapped in. And yes. she, was, she was also our largest female. Uh, if you look at the movie from Arizona Illustrated, um, I'm, I actioned, I'm carrying her. Um, I have a pink shirt on. She weighed 25 pounds. That's like 12 pounds more than many of the others, or 13. Okay. Is Avery still collar? No. She's, she dropped her collar last year, and one of the local residents here found the collar in the front yard. Their do the kids found the, the collar, so we were able to get it, so get it she's, back. So she's gone from your ability to No. Well, she is not being tracked with the radio collar. However, there are a variety of people here who have seen her enough and recognize her color markings and her tail markings, and so can say, that's Avery. And uh, Hans especially spent so much time and, and with her in his backyard and her behavior as such that it's just like coming back to home for the last couple of years. So we see her doing we see a bobcat doing all the Avery things. And so we're pretty comfortable that we're still seeing Avery. And that's the case on a number of the bobcats that we've collared uh, that we're able to continue to get reports from folks that, that know them very well and have seen them for a long time. Just out of curiosity, which part of the neighborhood was that that Avery was in? If you look on the map here, you will see the whole development is covered. Okay. And there's not just Avery. There are other bobcats that are coming in here than Avery. Avery is just one that we all kind of grabbed onto and has been kind of easy to, to follow and track. And she, she's a good mom and, and uh, uh, we've been able to do that kind of thing. But if you look at it, there's four or five different bobcats that get in here off and on uh, as part of the edges of their home range. 
um, is going uh, going on. Yes, ma'am. Uh, two years ago, I had a bobcat that was collared on my back patio, taking a nap up against the house. Mm -hmm. My house cats were going crazy at the time. Yeah. Um, and then last year, I think I saw Avery, but the one that was there before was older, and Avery looked like maybe that one's daughter. I don't know, but they weren't the same cat for sure. Right. They, they come in different color phases, so you will get a lot of variation from light browns and orangish colors to gray and uh, chocolate browns elements, etc. Et so it's, it's really kind of hard to distinguish. Even when we have the bobcat in hand, um, normally you use tooth wear as a way of aging, and that's about the only way you can age it. And that's very difficult as well to put a, uh, a good firm number on it. So uh, it's hard to tell. You know, some, we've had some females that have had young, and we've recaught the young, and they look older than mom did. Uh, and, I was judging by size. Yeah. The first one was really big, and the second one was much smaller. A, a common thing to think about in terms of size is that that a bobcat, again, is a lot smaller than we think it is. Those long legs make it look bigger. But you're talking about something that's 12 to 24 inches at the shoulder, only about 30 inches long before the tail. And so everything, once it reaches kind of the adult stage, falls within that. And then you have the variation of individuals. You have little bobcats, you have big bobcats, and that's just the genetics of that particular line of bobcats coming along. So, you know, you, you kind of get used to saying, yeah, that was probably a three to five female. If you, we look at a bobcat, when, when we would catch a bobcat, the first thing you kind of looked for when you came up to the trap was look at their feet. And if they have big feet, they're more, generally more male. And the females have smaller feet, a little more petite. Uh, and, and that doesn't hold up 100%, but that's kind of one of the circumstances we found. Yes? Are mountain lions a limitation? I understand Game and Fish is tracking some up in the higher reaches here in the Tucson Mountains. They're tracking some in Tucson Mountain Park. Yeah. And I live on the golf course in Star Pass, and I have one that goes by my house and okay. lives with bobcats and but coyotes. But being bigger and cats, do they the the kind of limit been, where the habitat can go? They're, 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 much, the they're much more elusive and, and um, impacted by human presence and activity. Than bobcats. So they coexist okay with so the, bobcats. So no well, like to eat them. Yeah, bo <laughs> Mount, mountain lions are a major predator on bobcats, uh -huh. and uh, so they will they will take bobcats uh, pretty readily. Right now, Game and Fish is doing a study on bobcats in the Altar Valley. Well, actually, three different spots in the state. It's a mortality study to try to come up with what are the major impacts that reduce the population. And they've had a tremendous amount of, uh, I may be overstating tremendous, but a significantly large number of bobcats killed by mountain lions in that study that they've documented. And it surprised a lot of us um, that, that we s were seeing that level of, of predation going on. How many radio tags do you have out? We only have two callers left out. They're on bobcats that live in the Santa Cruz River from sunset north, uh, pretty much. And then we've signaled them to drop, and they just haven't dropped yet. But uh, they sent a signal back, one did for sure, that said it's opened up, and so it's just a matter of coming off the bobcat, and then we have to go find it. How many do you have that are just tagged? Um, at the peak, we had 39 different bobcats with collars on them. We, radio? Yes, they're all satellite. They're all satellite radio. Um, they we had caught sixty five, no, sixty eight different or sixty eight bobcats, fifty six of those different bobcats, and we put collars on thirty nine of them. Okay. Well, have you got any others that are just like ear tag? 
We chose not to use ear tags at all in our research project. Um, so uh, everything that we're tracking and we've kept uh, 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 logs on are the collared bobcats. And to give you an idea, we're at about four years now in the project. We're going to end up with pretty close to 54,000 locations on the bobcats in the study area. And if you take just going straight line from point to point, add that up, it's about 24,000 miles of movement data. So we've got a, a tremendous database to play with and, and take a look at um, as we, we go forward. Anything going on at Sweetwater Wetlands now with Bobcat? <laughs> uh, <laughs> ouch. Um, no. We, we had a problem with Sweetwater Wetlands um, in that the photographers at Sweetwater saw one of their favorite male subjects with a collar and they went ballistic and uh, they we actually caught the male two miles away from Sweetwater and did not think he would be going down in that area and in fact we chose not to trap around Sweetwater because of the sensitivities of it but best uh, laid plans and um, they started a, uh, a petition to remove all the collars from all the bobcats because it was unkind and cruel and yes. worthless information, et cetera, et cetera. And it ruined their photographs. And it ruined their that photographs. The I think yeah. they, they didn't want to Photoshop. Just bad it was so, <laughs> so easy to take one of those it's so easy. Photoshop yeah. is but, pathetic. Yeah. <laughs> but it, um, Sweetwater is uh, an interesting place that we've watched because there are a variety of bobcats that are using it at the same time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so they're moving in and out of, of the preserve. Uh, at any given time, I'm going to guess we've got four or five bobcats using Sweetwater Preserve. Well, there's oh. that back quarter, you know, that actually is the closest to us if you look down there. Right. And it just, a lot of photographers ask me about it. And the thing that it concerns me is they get between mom and a cub or they get somewhere they shouldn't be around the cat yeah. or they get too close or the kid says oh i want to pet the kitty <laughs> right. you know and you and, got a big and, problem and some of the photographers there realize that and they tried to set up some standards because they yeah. realized ph photographers were approaching them and getting between cats and kittens moms and kittens and um but they seem to be an uncontrollable group. They were well, each real wildlife doctors don't do that, but yeah. Yeah. unfortunately, well, it, 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 it's it's a it's a not an uncommon wildlife related challenge between the interest in photography and and the enjoyment that people get out of great wildlife pictures and the process of getting those pictures, and uh, it's it's most of us don't appreciate and and. As scientists, we're just beginning to understand that um, most wildlife in that kind of a setting where people are taking very close photographs, the animal may not show any behavior that they're concerned, but physiologically, if you could measure it, and they are now beginning to measure it, that animal is incredibly stressed. And it really breaks down their ability um, uh, and raises inflammatory issues and the animal may well die as a secondary issue than from the actual relationship of the photographer and and that's why the photography wildlife photography community is really working on these standards and try to come up with new things and exactly the same thing goes on with hikers you see that same thing uh, they did some work with black bears and the black bear showed higher blood pressure issues even though there was no conflict between the hiker and the bear the bear just saw the hiker for something like 14 hours that they would still see the impact of that kind of thing so that's a one of those fascinating side pieces that come out of of the research and and kind of the stuff that we're, we're learning so some of the other things that we've learned about bobcats um, Avery uh, is really a, a, the poster child for the ability to 
raise kittens in a dense urban environment. You know, this is our fourth litter of kittens that we've documented here. And uh, coming back to some of the same houses uh, during that same period of time. And she essentially has, and this gets back to another little piece of the uh, um, research itself. We talk about, well, she, she's adapted to living in this environment. Well, my perspective is she's not adapted to anything. She's still doing what a bobcat does. If she were living in Saguaro National Park, her behaviors are the same, but she's just doing it in a different place. So she's not changed her behavior. She's not done anything different than what she would be expected to do. She just accepted this area and said, I can make a living here. I can raise kittens here. Life is good. Let's get on with it. And so she is able to take, you know, the development and make that look like natural terrain. So she's the one that's really good at roofs. She has been, she, she has been very, very good at raising her kittens and taking them and stashing them on the roofs in your development area. And they may be there for 30 to 40 days while she does that. If she gets bothered, she may move from one house to the next, move them back and forth several times. But she is, is really a tuned to what it takes to make a living in this environment. And she's very good at moving through the development, uh, utilizing different pathways. And uh, she knows where the dogs are. She knows where the problems are. She knows where the good bobcat houses are. <laughs> and, she's, and she just takes advantage of the, that kind of an activity. So yes. does that, do you think that being used to being around people lowers that stress response in her that she's able to deal with it? I think it probably does, yeah. Uh, you know, but that's me thinking versus me saying right, that right. we really know that. Um, but, you know, I think if she was pressured significantly, she would not continue to do what she's doing. I mean, she's, she's found a successful model. And she's an example of, an, an, of the bobcat being able to coexist with people perfectly well. She's moving around constantly in this development every night going out hunting, hunting successfully, bringing food back to those little kittens. You know, they were at Hans's place here recently. She's moved them again. That's not unusual. So we're kind of curious where she is now, but they're getting to the point where they're about big enough to follow her around. And then they will just stay with her as she begins to move out in this environment. But what we found is that corridors like this are perfectly great for a bobcat to move around in. And so if we look at, at zoning issues, if we can do new development, these natural pathways of drainages, et cetera, and open space kinds of circumstances, that's gonna be really good for bobcats. I, th yeah. I think one thing, uh, since, so I've lived in my develop my HOA for 24 and a, uh, 23 and a half years. And so we had one bobcat that we never captured. She's the only named uncollared bobcat. Her name is Petra. And Damn her. she <laughs> raised at least four <laughs> litters of kittens over the years. It, each one has a personality. Her personality was so different than Minnie, who we did capture and had the small home range. Petra would walk up one side of the sidewalk and you would walk on the other side with your dog on a leash and we could walk side by side wow. for a hundred yards. <laughs> she was comfortable with everybody and, and that part of her home range. Then there's another one who would never do that. And now we have one Daphne who we captured, who everybody knows, she doesn't have a collar on anymore. She'll just stop and sit in front of you because she's so non-threatened. 
but yeah. another one won't come near. And part of that is their personality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I volunteer with animals out at the Desert Museum, right. so but you see that with them too. Uh, they're mm -hmm. so different. They're like us. We're yeah. not all the same. Yeah. Can, can you talk to how the process of putting on a collar? Sure. So, first thing you got to do is catch a bobcat. <laughs> <laughs> What we were using is a uh, cage trap. It's kind of square, rectangular, about two feet high, about 15 inches wide or so. And inside of that, that cage is a treadle. And the front door lifts up, and as the bobcat walks in, it will step on the treadle and it will drop the cage. Then we would go in, and we have a, a system that allows us to drop some forks in the uh, cage and push the bobcat all the way to the back end of the cage so it couldn't run around or hurt itself, etc. And then just give it an injection. And it was a tranquilizer with three different uh, drugs that are very common. They're used by veterinarians. We, by the way, had a veterinarian on every bobcat we captured. They're working with us and monitoring everything that went on. And that, that will put the bobcat out generally 15 minutes to 30 minutes and then we have about 45 minutes to put the collar on. So we would take the bobcat out of the cage, start to do all kinds of, of measurements. Um, we took blood, we took DNA samples, uh, we took uh, feces, hair, uh, hair. hair, We the vet did a complete uh, body uh, search on the bobcat for any kinds of wounds or uh, other kinds of parasites. And the collar itself has a, a band and there's a, bo a little box on the bottom of it that has the battery for, this, for the collar and then a couple of little boxes up on top that are this communication with the satellite. And we just would then fit that specifically to the bobcat. And we chose only to collar bobcats that were 10 pounds or larger because of the weight of the collar. And so our collars are, were fairly light uh, going in as well. And then the way we went, we would let the bobcat come out of the tranquilizer. That might take an hour. We, just, we made a choice that sometimes you will just take the animal and find a shady spot and lay it under a tree and let it come out naturally. We chose to let it come out in the cage until it was 100% and then let it go and, and it would run away uh, at that point in time. Yeah. With these corridor areas, I think there was a proposal a couple of years ago to put in some trail running or jogging or something. And I'm wondering what impact does that have on that habitat area that's right now relatively pristine? It's going to change depending on the wildlife species you're talking about. And that's one always one of the challenges. But anytime you're putting in people activity on a routine basis, etc., that's going to be generally a challenge to the native wildlife species. One of the things that we see over on uh, um, Sweetwater Preserve is that about half of the preserve is not being used by bobcats. And it's where the densest trail system is yeah. on the park. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, it's just enough activity going on there. That and the fact that the park does not have any free water uh, is, is a, a, a barrier to it. Yes? Was there some kind of a signal that the cage would give off when it was triggered? No. We, we, what we would do is set the, the cages and come back at daylight. And so we checked all the cages every day at daylight. And uh, uh, so the most we would find a bobcat would be a few hours or so uh, in the cages themselves. We actually put uh, cameras monitoring some of the cages early on. And it's <laughs> the, the look on some of the bobcats' faces is kind of like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they, they don't fight the cage much at all. Uh, so they just would lay down and every once in a while they'd get up and wander around and push things around a little bit and then go back and lay down again and 
until we came in to work on them. <coughs> We'd have about 30 traps out at the same time when we'd be working for two or three weeks. And we worked in two teams, two people on each team, and we'd split the up. And every morning at dawn, we would go and check everyone. And we needed to check pretty quickly because <coughs> our vets are volunteers. And so we needed to call them if we had a bobcat or if we had two and let them know and then tell us their ETA and we'd meet them and then we'd quickly work. So are there any traps active right now or not? I'm sorry? Are you trapping right now? No, we, we quit trapping early on. One of the things is that um, we also didn't trap when the females had kittens mm -hmm. uh, because we just yeah. didn't want to uh, preferred not to have that as an issue. We did have some where we had females that we had been tracking for a long time and we needed to cha try to change their collar out so we had to try to crap them again and often they would if they had kittens we could do the mother and the, the, the kitten at the same time we catch the kitten easiest and then the mom would be pacing around worrying about the kitten and then uh, we would catch her and be able to put a uh, collar on her yeah so um, just briefly, um, I want to respect your time. Yeah. So uh, the, the your presentation is amazing. We hey, can't thank I'm, you enough I'm you. paid by the hour. <laughs> so, I, I just wanted to make sure that I got a few questions in for those who couldn't attend today, because I know we have some neighbors that are a little concerned about bobcats in the community. And that's one of the reasons you're here is because we wanted them to hear from the experts instead of hearing from all of us who may have had positive experiences, but that may not offset the fear factor of actually running into a bobcat. So if I could just ask you three questions. The first is, how are bobcats being received in other com communities your study has touched upon? One of the things that we did with the study is put together a survey of attitudes and values. Yeah. And we have 1,500 completed surveys from the Tucson area uh, that we've been looking at. 95% of the people who responded to the survey, and it, it is a self-selected survey, but um, are positive about the relationship of working and living with bobcats. There's a segment that in wildlife we are able to kind of identify different kinds of characteristics of how people look at wildlife. Um, we have one we call them naturalistic, and they just love the idea of bobcats living in their environment. And we have another one that's called negativistic, and that's that these people are afraid of wildlife. And it's a, it's a legitimate fear, and so they look at wildlife from a very negative point of view. Uh, and the, the national is around 10% of the population has a primary negativistic point of view. So it's pretty close to what we saw in our survey in that it, we have seven, eight percent that have a negative perspective on it. So for the most part, people are, who are willing to, again, maybe change a, a simple behavior or look at things from a slightly different point of view, um, it's, a, it's a positive. And uh, my truck here has a sign on the side of the door says Bobcats in Tucson Research. We were we knew we were going to be driving in housing developments and I figured I better put a sign up or we'd be talking to the sheriff every time we were out at daylight <laughs> tracking or doing something different. I get stopped all the time from people at the bank. Bobcats! I love Bobcats! <laughs> you know, and it has been amazing how well the community will interact with us and stop to talk about bobcats. One thing, everybody's got a bobcat story. <laughs> and uh, and they're going to tell you your bobcat story, so you might as well just <laughs> get over get, getting in and getting your work done in the, or getting the groceries at the store. You're going to get the story. It's just like so it's, it's a very positive <laughs> one. Uh, the second question is, um, we have a lot of walkers that uh, frequent our common areas with their dogs. It's one of the highlights of living here is we have this beautiful environment that we can walk on, lots of shade, shade trees, and should those walkers be concerned if they're walking their dog and they encounter a bobcat while they're out? No, but a javelina. <laughs> yeah. 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 They should, we're talking about the difference between being bitten by a white shark in the ocean 
and getting in a car accident. The javelina are a car accident. It's okay. The javelina and dogs don't mix. Gail's got the dogs in the bobcat. And if the bobcat, if the bobcat sees you in a dog, and it's the bobcat's going to decide if it wants to be seen. It's going to hide if it's afraid or leery or whatever. Or like Petra, she'll walk along with you. So the bobcat's not going to tr kill the dog to eat it. It's too big, <laughs> for the most part. Yeah. Even some of the smaller dogs. Yeah, you know, that, that's that's something they won't take on. They're not friends of canines. They don't like coyotes. Therefore, they don't like dogs. So they're gonna try to look at, at things. But again, if they're used to people, one of the things that I always say is, when I look at a bobcat, and, and I'm, as a biologist, so I'm not supposed to do this, I think they look at me with disdain. <laughs> they, they just kinda look at you and you just go like, what are you doing in my environment? Like any other cat. Yeah, well, <laughs> absolutely. And so, so that, so that's, you're much more likely to have problems with, with javelina coyotes. or coyotes, walking dogs, than you are going to have with bobcats. If you're afraid, if you're uncomfortable, have a walking stick. Take the walking stick with you out there. It's not a bad thing anyway. And the other is you can go down to the store and buy one of these little air horns like they have for boats for distress that fit in your pocket. Don't mess with pepper spray. That's, that's not going to work very well. You can do it. But that loud noise, if you suddenly have a, 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 an attack situation, hit that loud noise and that bobcat's going to take off. Scare the heck out of your dog, too. Yeah. <laughs> it gets everybody's attention. And, and this is the last question. From, so um, many residents welcome seeing bobcats in their yards, but uh, others, and it's perfectly understandable and reasonable, may, may fear an encounter. And what advice might you have for those who prefer not to have bobcat visiting in their backyard? Like, is there anything they can do to their backyard so that it doesn't, it's not, uh, you know, welcoming to, to bobcats? Yeah, there, there are a variety of things. Uh, one of the things that we're finding is that definitely there's a selection by a lot of the females with kittens to backyards that have large block walls. And basically what they're doing is they're bringing that kitten inside the block wall where they're captured. They can't get away. And as they get older and wander around, they're contained in a safe environment. As soon as the kitten can get up the wall, you'll see they'll disappear. And so, it, you know, the, so there are things about places that are desirable, um, you know, nice crevices that are cool and shady where they can store the kids out of sight and etc. Uh, that are good. One of the things that we found is that if you don't want a bobcat in your backyard, the best thing you can do is make direct eye contact with that bobcat and tell it to go away. I don't want you here. And they uh, react very negatively to that eye to eye contact. That's why you will walk by and they will just kind of like, you know, <laughs> walk and look away from you and that kind of thing. So your behavior can make the difference uh, of having bobcats in the backyard or not having bobcats in the backyard. Uh, you know, fairly inexpensively, you can buy these water sprinklers that are uh, motion activated, plant it out in the backyard, the bobcat walks along, you get spacked with the spray. That's not something they want to mess around with and enjoy. So that, that's another fairly inexpensive behavior modification uh, technique with, with the bobcats. So if you actually want one in your backyard, what would you want to take? <laughs> 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 and a bird and so, rabbit out there. <laughs> so, so there, you know, it, it's really uh, <clears throat> making it, thinking about making it uncomfortable for that bobcat if you choose not to want them in your, your area. But for the most part, a lot of people don't have a clue they've got bobcats utilizing their area. Yeah. Well, uh, it was like Avery three years ago when we first got her here in, the, in this particular development. Um, she was in a house that was for sale. Yep. Uh, it was vacant. And uh, 
we I found know. her the day they were having an open house and she was on the roof and then she moved across the street we went over and we talked to the gentleman across the street and said by the way do you know you have a bobcat right there and huh <laughs> we've heard something thumping on the roof right yeah so uh, you know, you, you, you get different circumstances, different kinds of, of well, then opportunities. Well, we lived right next door and never saw her, so. Yeah. <laughs> we inadvertently had two of those plastic Adirondack chairs against our back wall, mm -hmm. and once the kittens figured out how to climb up and climb on the wall, poof, they were gone. Yeah, yeah. So if yeah. anybody doesn't want a bobcat, get those, get some chairs or something where the kittens can easily get out, and yeah. chances are they won't have yes. yeah. Avery's had several litters. Yes. As they grow up, does she say, get the hell out of here, this is my territory? Good. Do they have to go find a new place? Good good question. And generally speaking, the, the common thought is that most young bobcats disperse uh, the following year from when they're born. Uh, so they're born January, February, and they disperse January, February the following year, just before the female rebreeds. And what we have found, which is going to be a fascinating one for us in the, in the project to look at, is that we have mothers and daughters sharing a home range together. And that's, that's incredibly unusual. That's not common at all. And then what we found is uh, we've done the DNA, so we know who's related to who. And uh, when we look at our DNA map, we have mother, daughter sharing a home range adjacent to an aunt, adjacent to another daughter. And so there's a connection there that uh, hasn't really been explored uh, and may well say that our thought that bobcats are fairly solitary except for during the breeding season may not fit in this environment may fit somewhere else but here because of the high quality habitat the density of the bobcats uh, the, there's some additional socialization that goes on where we're trying to take that 53,000 locations and do some cross-referencing and can we find where bobcats that are in a so, uh, adjacent home ranges are getting pretty close to each other, which might indicate that they're doing it. Uh, Cheryl Mollahan, our other uh, co-founder and, and leader, our, our uh, science investigator, is in Ohio right now, and she's been working in Ohio on bobcats there for the last 10 years. And she has a place where they're in the fourth generation of bobcats coming together. And so the grandmother will literally come into a particular area that's in the middle of the other bobcats and start to call. Grandchildren. Yeah. Reunion. And, and the grandkids all come to visit. Do they mark, do they mark their territory? Yes. Most of what bobcats are doing when they're doing a home range is they're marking their territory with urine. Oh, but we have no evidence that the males are staying in the home range. The males seem to have to leave and get right. their own place. So they don't hang around. We had one of Avery's one of Avery's kids um, two years ago uh, was caught north of El Camino del Cerro. Uh, well, let's say El Camino del Cerro. He and his brother, we caught both of the brothers. <laughs> And, Dumb and, and dumber. <laughs> <laughs> we had four traps out. Yeah. Okay, in this big array. So it was lots of it, it was a long, things. ugly story. It was not <laughs> it was not the Bobcat Trapper's best day. <laughs> let, let's say that. But we did catch them. And we were able to we had a brand new collar that's uh, being designed and it's a very small one, so we could put it on a younger bobcat. So we put it on one of the young guys, Tippy. Turn Tippy loose. Tippy stayed around with Avery for a couple of months and then basically overnight went from El Camino del Cerro to Irvington. Wow. Oh my goodness. And hung up down at Drexel and Irvington, stayed there for several months, and then uh, the collar fell off. So that was the last yeah. of the information that we had. So, uh, and we've had 
circumstances where young adult males might move 30, 40 miles uh, mm -hmm. and other places uh, as part of dispersal. And again, the kind of dispersal is really impacted by the quality of the environment and the habitat. We had another one, um, uh, Danielle, right? Yeah. Danielle, uh, one of our females down here, she lived in this area and was up out of the, the bottom of the, the river bottom, etc., and for a year or more, and had a very established home range, uh, had a house just out over here of Gorette, and um, that she came to a lot. And one of the females that we had collared down in the Sweetwater Preserve, or Sweetwater Wetlands, got hit by a car. And she moved her whole home range and took over that vacant home range in two days. And it has been there ever since until where the collar dropped off. So there is a dynamic going on as well that these home ranges are, are kind of uh, organic in that they will move in and out, etc. And you will see uh, with a bobcat, a bobcat does not have a home. It doesn't have a cave that it goes to all the time. Or, you know, a lot of people think of them in one spot. They are moving throughout their home range constantly, and they're going to probably cover their whole home range in seven to ten days. Hmm. They will make the route on, on that. And they know who's been here, who's in the area, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, been and on the post by our front door. <laughs> so yeah. you know, so and, they're going around the perimeter. And so when we would track a trap, we would trap where they close by where two people would be going by checking their, their property. So you have more chance of catching yeah a bobcat as opposed to in the middle of a home range. Mm -hmm. Can I ask, do they, um, I have my neighbors that have cats that they let out, house cats. Mm -hmm. Will bobcats go after house cats? Mm -hmm. Yet I thought they would between the coyotes, the javelina, and the bobcats that they shouldn't be letting their cats out. And the yeah. Cooper's I hawks. have one cat. Yeah, and the hawks. I have yeah. one cat that is, on, I have two wildlife cameras. Yeah. It has, it's alive three years later, and I don't know why, yeah. because yeah. Yeah. the mountain lion comes by, and the bobcats come by, and the coyotes, and that cat is still alive. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. They're, they're opportunistic <coughs> predators in the sense okay. that they're going to take advantage of food sources that are available to them. Okay. And they're going to also take advantage of food sources that are easier to get. You know, we always talked about when we were capturing black bears, we actually would, would create a, 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 a zone, in a, almost like a little teepee of vegetation, and the bait would be in the back of the vegetation, and it would be solid around the edges of it, backed up against a big tree. And we always said, the black bear's not dumb. Why not go right through the opening instead of through the side where it's solid? It's kind of like you in the refrigerator. Open the door. It's the easiest way to get in. And so you see this with, with the, the, the trapping and, and the predation. They're going to take a, a advantage of these easier things. And a couple just uh, quick stories. We have a female. She was our second female. And as you come in on... Uh, Dos Picos, I think that's Dos Picos right there, the tall peak. Yeah, that's Dos Picos, uh, right at the edge of Tucson Mountain Park. So Morgan was captured right by the old uh, International Wildlife Museum. We caught her right behind the museum. Her first year, she came in and she went right to the top of the Dos Picos and that's where she had her kittens. And she's had her kittens every year since then at that same spot. And she raises her kittens up, which 60 days, something like that. And then she moves right back down to Anklum in the houses along Anklum Road. Well, she's figured this out. She loves zero negative edge, negative pools. edge pools. Cause she's figured it out. There's a concrete edge down here, right? And these dumb birds fly in 
and land right on the edge of the concrete pool to get water and they're looking that way and I'm back here <laughs> and we we have this great video and she'll just sit there and watch and then <laughs> jumps up grabs a dove drops back down again if you look at our website and you look at the videos and the and the photographs um, you'll see how we um, capture a bobcat there's a trap all that stuff is there you'll see the video of Morgan going right up in the air and coming down um, we, when we went there once to change the camera there was a pile of feathers at least a foot high <laughs> and, and, and why I didn't take a picture of it it's just it was stupid but uh, I'll we, never forget it one of our, our volunteers who loves doing spreadsheets um, took the camera data that we had so she went through the analysis and Morgan was successful in catching a dove about 40 percent of the time which is phenomenal, phenomenal. and her, her best was I think four or five doves in eight minutes <laughs> what is their main diet in our area the main diet in this area we're thinking is going to be end up being probably birds because of all the bird feeders that people have out etc we think they're going to be really keyed in on quail and doves um, here um, secondarily the more common kinds of things you would find here is rabbits um, pack rats uh, desert mice uh, snakes and lizards and I've seen Avery carrying a rabbit yeah. 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 She's pretty successful. She's a pretty successful hunter. Yeah. At one point, we saw Avery hanging off our back wall, facing the other way, on her elbows. Yeah. We thought, yes. what in the world is that cat doing? Well, she finally sort of gracefully got down. She had a big dove in her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> right. She gave it to one of the kittens, yeah. and he demolished it. Yeah. Nothing left, not even a feather. He ate everything and wouldn't wow. let the other kitten have any. So it was okay. Are these stickers? Right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Help her out. So, do you have plans to uh, put recolor them, or are you done? We're so done, you could stick a fork in us. <laughs> no. Uh, we would. We would love to to do some follow up stuff, but we're just getting long in the tooth to be doing some of this stuff and. We're trying to work with the university right now and get a couple of grad students and, we and two cars mentor them and I've got a huge uh, give us some, <laughs> some of our equipment. We can give them our equipment. Um, collars cost about $2,500 a piece, and, uh, but they are reusable, but it's about $1,800 to revamp them. But we have the collars all left from, from here that we'd like to work on. We'd really love to go do the Central Tucson the Arizona Inn. We've got some folks over there to, to work with, and uh, we'd we'd really like to try to see that really dense urban environment. The U of A, U of A grad student we worked with, uh, she did her part of her project was looking at u activity, and she had trail cameras in a lot of the washes through the center part of Tucson, and so she was able to kind of get an idea. Uh, to get an idea of what was going on. So I think a couple of years ago we saw you out at Police Paseos. Yes. And was it yes. the Boy Scouts that were with? There was there was a group of young people. No, it's hard to tell. We 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 all actually. Uh, I was chief of education for Arizona Game and Fish. Oh. Okay. So I'm very much kid. <laughs> and uh, education outreach oriented. Um, we've worked with the county parks um, a lot on, on different kinds of things and so they may have, we may have had a, a day there. I've done a lot of stuff with the Wildlife Museum. We're working with Charlotte over here and, and she has a, a, a follow-up grant from Game and Fish and Heritage Fund to develop a wildlife curriculum uh, activities around some of the stuff that we've learned and uh, utilizing some of the videos and the data, etc., that's been very successful. For those of us that love urban bobcats, what can we do? Sightings? Should we be contacting the website? Is there something that we could do to help you with your research? Um, 
definitely on the, the website, you could come take the survey if you haven't done that and, and report sightings. And not just a sighting, if you have multiple sightings, we want those multiple sightings. So every time you see a bobcat, unless it's like every day, um, you know, it's once a month or something like that, that's good information for us. We may not use it in our final report, but it's going to be a part of our database that we'll continue on with. So that's good. The main thing you can do is be an advocate for bobcats. You know, try to get at some of the urban myth out there about bobcats. There's a lot of urban myth that bobcats jump over the fence, kill dogs, drag them over the fence, etc. You know, that's not bobcat. That's not bobcat behavior. People are concerned about bobcats spreading disease. Right now, we've had the recent rabies thing that's in the paper. Well, we had the first bobcat reported positive rabies in the Tucson area last fall. It had been 15 years before that was the last time we had a bobcat with rabies. The rabies is not an issue with bobcats, as it might be with foxes and coyotes, etc. And also did the same thing with diseases. One of the biggest problems we now know uh, with bobcats too is if you're using um, spray or rodenticides to, uh, or poisons to try to get at pack rats, etc. Don't use the poison, utilize other methodologies, i.e. clean up the environment, take away their middens, uh, you know, lift up the vegetation a little bit so that it's less again less attractive to that. But there's a wonderful project that's been going on for decades over in South Carolina uh, on Kyle Island. Um, they're, they're one of the few communities that has a full-time wildlife biologist in the community. And they've been working on bobcats for, like I say, about two decades. They found uh, and had a major issue go through the population and they lost about 75% of their bobcats as a result of rodenticide getting into the food chain on the island. And it was a lot of people that just hired a, uh, a pest control company to come in and uh, they chose to use the wrong stuff. There are uh, alternatives to some of the rodenticides that are being used. So, you know, you a, a good pest control company can offer up less toxic stuff out there, but for the most part, um, mechanically removing the habitat for the yeah. pack rats is the best way to go. Mm -hmm. so, so this is an air horn question, not a bobcat question. Do they work on javelinas? Uh, yes, they will. Um, but they, you don't want to do it too often, but uh, if the, it's a surprise, should work pretty well on Havelina. Can you put them on garbage cans? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. If, if there was a good way to put those on garbage cans, I would be rich and living in the Bahamas. <laughs> you just have to get up early and put yeah, it yeah. out the morning of. Yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> just be thankful it's uh, Havelina and not black bears. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We had a we worked with them on Pine Top on black bears and this is exactly the same thing as javelina yeah. but instead of a javelina crawling out of the garbage can it's a 80 pound yeah yearling black bear well, i just wanted to take a second to really thank bobcats in tucson yes. for helping us understand how incredibly lucky we are to have bobcats in our community for coming out here and educating us uh, we do have this certificate of appreciation uh, originally this was for carrie but carrie said nope it's got to be for bobcats in Tucson because it's all of us that are doing this. And I kind of feel like, you know, the, the vibe I get from this community right now is we're all kind of part of bobcats in Tucson, which is wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, thank, you, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you. For I you get guys the same as well. vibe. Yeah. yeah. If you have questions, feel free to send it to the bobcats in Tucson at gmail.com. And uh, somebody will probably have a chance to drop you a, a response. Get a hold of Hans. Hans knows how to catch Gail and I. We live here, and you know, obviously, we hate talking about bobcats. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, we're glad to answer questions. You, you have somebody you know that's having a bobcat problem. We'll try to help. We'll you know try to come up with some ideas of, of mitigation and solution. 
Um, we're working hard with Arizona Game and Fish to kind of um, raise their awareness on opportunities. So uh, contacting Game and Fish is another opportunity, and they they generally uh, send people on to us once uh, you check in with them.